So this will kind of continue from the previous lecture that we were talking about. We looked at the uh, shoulder girdle and the upper, extremor, uh, upper extremity. Now we'll look at the pelvic girdle and the lower extremities. And now just as we started off with a case, the case of Aaron Rodgers and his broken clavicle on the last lecture, we'll start out with a case here uh, with Edna. So you can see here that Edna slipped going down the stairs last night and she has pain in her left back, hip and knee and is not able to walk without quite a bit of pain. Uh, she tried to stay at home overnight, but the pain hasn't gone away this morning, and she still can't walk, so she comes uh, to the emergency room. As you look at her lying on the bed, you can see that her left leg is externally rotated, and it looks shorter than the right leg. She has severe pain when you try to uh, rotate that hip internally. Uh, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? So I'll let you guys kind of in your mind, think about the type of injury, what you're seeing on the exam, where her pain is, and try to think of where you think the injury might be. And then we will come back to Edna about halfway through this lecture and talk about where her problem is. So we're gonna start uh, this the second half discussion looking first at the pelvic girdle. So that's gonna be the pelvis here and then we will look at the lower extremity. So if we look at the pelvis, the pelvis is really uh, two, uh, largely composed of two bones that are symmetrical uh, and attach posteriorly at the sacrum and anteriorly at the pubic symphysis. But within each of those pelvic bones, we actually uh, describe three separate bones uh, and we'll talk about those here in a minute. So here, remember you're always asking yourself the question, what view uh, am I looking at? So here we're gonna look at a lateral view to start. So that's, that's here looking at someone kind of from the side. And if we took away the femur, so if we took the femur out, what would the pelvis look like? And so this would be looking at, let's say the right pelvis from a lateral view. So this is going to be anterior here, and this is going to be posterior here, and this is going to be superior here, and this is going to be inferior here. So if we take a look, I think the most obvious thing that you see is this kind of uh, depression area, this circle. Um, this is called the acetabulum. Acetabulum. This is where the head of the femur inserts into the pelvic bone in order to create your hip joint. And something that's a little bit different here um, than the shoulder joint, when, when we were talking about the upper extremity and we talked about the shoulder joint, um, that, that shoulder joint is pretty, that glenoid cavity is pretty shallow. And so I don't think I mentioned it in that lecture, but I'll mention it now, that that makes the glenohumeral joint actually the uh, the most easily or one of the most easily dislocated joints. So I have to often relocate joints um, in the emergency room and I've seen some thumbs come out of place and fingers come out of place and kneecaps slide out of place but for sure the largest number of dislocations uh, come from the shoulder and that's because the shoulder you know kind of moves in all directions uh, and that makes it great for mobility, but doesn't make it so great for support. The hip, on the other hand, is a much deeper, and you'll see this when we get in the lab together and we look at the models together, you'll see that the hip joint is much deeper and well-protected uh, than the shoulder joint. So anyway, on the pelvic side, on the pelvic bone side, that fossa, or that depression that the head of the femur fits in, is called the acetabulum. And so you can call that the acetabular fossa, um, which would be basically the depression for the acetabulum. Okay, I think that's pretty easy to see. I think there's also this large empty space here is pretty easy to see. And the term obturator um, is going to refer to, um, there's gonna be some muscles, there's some nerves, there's even some arteries and veins that have the name obturator. And that basically means going through this inferior portion of the pelvis. Uh, 
Um, so we're going to call that hole the obturator foramen. You remember the term foramen just means hole, like the foramen magnum of the skull, if you remember. So this is the obturator foramen. So foramen just means hole, and obturator tells you where it is in the body, in this case, the inferior pelvis. So I think that's also easily definable. Then if we look at kind of what's left, you can see really most of the hip is superior, right? Is, is kind of, you know, up here in this area. And that's going to be um, where, we'll, where we'll kind of focus this lateral view. We'll be looking at this part. Um, so a few things that you can see on the lateral. Remember, we have anterior here on this side and posterior on this side. And so um, we're going to have an anterior and superior, right? This is superior up this way. So we have an anterior superior iliac spine. That's, that's just this little kind of pokey out part. And then there will be a posterior inferior um, iliac spine over here. So you can see how this one is more superior, this one is more inferior, this one is anterior, and this one is posterior. So you have an anterior superior iliac spine and you have a posterior inferior iliac spine. So spine just means bony projection that's kind of sharp or pointy, right? The posterior inferior or anterior superior, that's just telling you the location. And iliac is because that portion of the pelvis we call the ilium. If you see, let's just zoom in here real quick to get these three parts of the bone um, kind of uh, fixated in our minds. It's, it's really one complete bone, um, the pelvic bone, but we, we identify three areas and give each area a different name. And actually, we would call them different bones. So for example, we would say, this is the iliac bone, this is the ischial bone, this is the pubic bone. Um, but you can tell from looking at it, and when we look at the models in class, it looks like one bone. So, uh, But anyway, we do separate into three parts. So the ilium is kind of the majority of the pelvic bone is the ilium. Uh, the ischium is going to be the posterior and inferior part of the pelvic bone. So you would think inferior and posterior to the obturator foramen um, or to the acetabulum. And then the pubis is going to be anterior and inferior um, to the ilium. So you can see three parts of the pelvic bone, ilium, ischium, and pubis. Okay, and you're going to see those names then coming up in the names of the portion of the a bone that we were looking at. So we have iliac there, we have iliac there, because those spines come off the iliac bone or the ilium. Okay, there are some gluteal lines. I'm not gonna make you learn these. I'll just point them out because they're here on your picture. This is where some of those gluteal muscles attach to. Um, so just like we have an anterior superior iliac spine, we also have an anterior because it's still anterior, but it's inferior to the previous spine. So this is going to be the anterior inferior iliac spine. If we kind of continue looking anteriorly and continue to go inferior, uh, the other uh, part that I would want you to know is this ramus. So the ramus is kind of this whole section of bone that uh, kind of comes around the obturator foramen. So you have a superior pubic ramus because it's kind of above the obturator foramen. And then you have an inferior pubic ramus uh, because it's in the inferior part of the pubic bone. And then the ischium also has a ramus or part that goes around the obturator foramen. So you can see there's three rami, we would say. So one ramus, or you can say three rami, the superior pubic, the inferior pubic, and the ischial ramus. So those are just portions that are going around that obturator foramen. 
I do want to point out inferiorly, another important structure is this ischial spine. This is important um, for obstetrics. The baby has to be able to um, pass through that area. Um, and it's sometimes part of the obstetrical exam that we do when we evaluate a woman and how open her pelvis is uh, to allow a baby through. All right, so we're going to see some of these structures again, and we're going to learn some new structures as we change from lateral view now to a medial view. So this would be uh, looking on the inside of the pelvic bone as opposed to the outside of the pelvic bone. And we still are going to have... Uh, you know, ilium up here, and ischium here, and pubis here. Um, this is going to be superior, inferior. This is going to be anterior here, and this is going to be posterior on this side. So this, as you kind of look for, you know, look at this inside view of the pelvis, we see the obturator foramen again. So that's just that hole that kind of gives you. Um, a focus point. And I think the other thing that's, you know, kind of stands out on the medial view is this arc, arcuate line that runs kind of at this oblique angle across the uh, inside of the pubic bone, the arcuate line. As you go superior to the arcuate line, you have what's called the iliac fossa. Remember, fossa just means depression. Uh, so and when you get in the lab and you hold a pelvis in your hand, you'll see that there's kind of a depression up here on most of the ilium on the inside view. Another thing that becomes obvious is this kind of large rough patch of bone here. And remember, kind of rough projections of bone we call tuberosities. And because it's the ilium, it's the iliac tuberosity. So you'll see that as well on the lab. Um, this is just the articular surface where the uh, pelvic bone articulates with the sacrum. Just as we had a, on the lateral view, we could see those iliac spines. Um, we're going to see some of those here on the medial view as well. So there again is the anterior superior. Here is the anterior inferior. Here is the posterior inferior iliac spines. I want to point out this notch you can see here, this kind of C-shaped uh, part of the bone. That's called the greater sciatic notch. And then there's a lesser sciatic notch below that, which is formed here by the, the spine of the ischium. Remember, we saw that on the other uh, view, on the lateral view, we saw the ischial spine. We see it here again on the medial view. And just as there's an iliac tuberosity up here, there's also a smaller ischial tuberosity, a rough projection of bone. And then remember we had the ischial ramus, the inferior pubic ramus, and the superior pubic ramus, all kind of forming the circle around that obturator foramen. So a lot of the same structures from a different view, but you've learned a few new structures on this view as well. Okay, let's continue looking at the pelvis. Um, so we've been looking at just kind of half a pelvis, or what we call a, a hemipelvis. Uh, now we're going to look at what the whole pelvis looks like together. So here's that iliac fossa that we were talking about. It's, and you can kind of see from this view, it looks more like a, a depression. And I want to point out just a, a few um, new things that you can see. Um, so remember that uh, arcuate line, you can now see the arcuate line forms really what we would call the pelvic inlet. Um, it actually forms the opening of the pelvis when you put the two sides of the pelvis together, uh, together with the sacrum. So that's not new, but you can see it in a different view and understand it better. Where the, um, the ilia, so one ilium, two ilia, where the ilia articulate with the sacrum, this is the sacrum here, you have a joint, and that's called the sacroiliac joint. And that joint commonly gets inflamed um, or sometimes even partially dislocated, uh, so you'll want to know that term, sacroiliac joint. You'll hear that a lot clinically. 
the tops of the hip, kind of what, um, what a woman would say when, when a woman says, I carry my baby on my hip, for example, or my pants won't stay up on my hips. What she really means, she doesn't mean down here at the hip joint. What she really means is up here at the iliac crest. So when people talk kind of commonly about where their hips are, um, they're talking about where their iliac crests are. It's the, kind of the top of the iliac bone. It's that rounded part. You can feel it if you just uh, kind of put your uh, thumb and forefinger, you know, up from your hip joint and move on up the side of the abdomen. You'll feel the top of your hips. That's the iliac crest. Uh, we can see again the acetabulum. Nothing new there. Um, I did want to point out this pubic symphysis. This is a fibrous piece of cartilage uh, that connects uh, these two pubic portions of the pelvis together. Um, you can see the obturator foramen on both sides again. And of course, we've got ischium, we've got you know, ilium, and then we've got pubic bone again. So not a lot of new structures here, but you're just kind of seeing them in a different way. But notice how symmetrical everything is. Because you have the pelvis, uh, pelvic bone on the right and pelvic bone on the left are exactly the same, you end up with a, a very symmetrical looking pelvis. Posteriorly, you could look at the whole pelvis together and you can see the sacrum here again in the middle the iliac crests again from behind. Um, the ischial spines I want you to see because they really kind of form the, the narrowest point in obstetrics that a baby's head has to pass through when passing through the mother's pelvis. The most narrow part is the space right here between these ischial spines. So as the baby kind of comes down like that, the baby has to pass through a very narrow portion between the ischial spines. And you can see the ischial tuberosities again. Um, nothing else really new here that we haven't seen before, just getting a different view. All right, speaking of obstetrics, we often talk about um, pelvic inlet and pelvic outlet, and that's because we're talking about basically the passageway the baby has to uh, move through in, in order to go from the uterus to the outside world. So we might say that, you know, the, the, the whole circumference of the outside of the pelvis, so looking at the iliac crests, um, we might say that's the greater pelvis. That's kind of the greatest diameter. But when we're talking about uh, obstetrics in a baby, the baby doesn't really uh, care so much about the greater pelvis. The baby cares more about the pelvic uh, inlet which would be the space created by the arcuate line. That would be the pelvic inlet. And the pelvic outlet, which is perhaps even more, um, you can kind of see it would be this area formed by the ischial spines. And because that's the narrowest portion, that's the one that we're typically most concerned with in obstetrics, can the baby fit through the pelvic outlet? Can the baby's head fit between this space, between the ischial spines? Now this is kind of giving you an inferior view so that you can see the pelvic outlet better. You can see that it's formed by the ischial spines, by the pubic symphysis, and by the coccyx. And that forms the pelvic outlet and the baby's head has to be able to fit through there. Male and female pelvises are um, have a different structure. Um, female pelvises are really built for delivering a baby, and a male pelvis is built more for strength and stability. So this little table here kind of tells you some of the adaptations of a female pelvis to help it uh, basically deliver a baby better carry a baby and deliver a baby. So the pelvis tends to be more shallow so that the, the distance the baby has to travel is smaller. Um, it's broad to allow more space for the baby's head to, to move through. Uh, 
the sacrum is less curved, again, to allow more space for the baby. You can see it's wider and more circular. There's an enlarged pelvic outlet. Um, and even this pubic angle here is wider, which just, again, allows more space. I'll just add one more thing. This pubic symphysis that we talked about is a type of cartilage, fibrous cartilage. Um, and it actually loosens during childbirth and actually allows the space here to expand just a little bit, uh, maybe just a centimeter. Uh, but that centimeter may be exactly the amount of space that the baby's head needs to make it through. And this is why pregnant women, especially as they get later in their pregnancy, they sometimes feel like when they're walking, they're not very stable. They feel like um, they feel loose down in their pelvis and down in their hips. And that's because the, the cartilage is actually physically loosening, becoming uh, less firm and allowing that pelvis to open up just a little bit more. The picture here, just take a look at that. Uh, you'll get used to seeing this clinically. This is uh, this looks just like the. I mean, if you go from here, you see it looks exactly the same, right? This is the this is a uh, X-ray of a male pelvis, and you can see uh, down here. This is the femur. We'll talk about that here in just a minute, right? There's the obturator foramen. See how symmetrical they are, and that's how you look for fractures in the pelvis. You look for symmetry. You say. Do the obturator foramens look symmetrical? Now, you have to also make sure that your x-ray is exactly straight on, anterior to posterior. If there's rotation of the pelvis, uh, then obviously the symmetry will break down. But as long as you have a nice anterior to posterior uh, view, um, you should have a lot of symmetry here on the pelvis, and that's gonna help you determine if there's a problem. If you lose symmetry on one side, then that's going to give you a clue that that's where the problem is. Okay, so here's the acetabulum. <clears throat> Let me uh, change the color here so we can see it a little bit better. There's the acetabulum on either side. We already mentioned the obturator foramina. You can see the arcuate line. Kind of looks like a C and a backwards C. You can see the pubic symphysis, and it should have about that distance. You can see the sacroiliac joint on the left and the sacroiliac joint on the right. You can see the crests of the ilium, or the iliac crests. Um, and then you can see um, back here, this is the, the sacrum and the coccyx in here. And then this would be the lumbar spine. But notice how symmetrical the right and left are. That's really key to looking at a pelvic x-ray is the symmetry. All right, as we move down from the pelvis, we're going to start looking at uh, the femur. So that's going to be the first bone that attaches to the pelvis. Um, and it's what forms the hip joint with the pelvic bone. So we are talking about the acetabulum of the pelvic bone, and it's the head of the femur here that fits into the acetabulum. So the head of the femur goes into the acetabulum and that makes your hip joint. So we've seen a head before in several bones. If you remember the humerus, there was a head. Uh, remember there was also a neck, right? So the part that's just distal to the head is gonna be the neck. So in this case, this is going to be the neck of the femur. Um, and then of course the shaft of the femur is gonna be this part. But notice in between the neck and the femur, there's a couple of other structures. There's this kind of projection here, which we're gonna call the lesser trochanter. If you see lesser, that means there must be a greater somewhere. So if we look up here, this is the greater trochanter. Um, and this is what you would feel if you kind of poke on the lateral side of your hip. Uh, if you're thin, probably thinner than me, you can actually feel the greater trochanter. And if you um, kind of want me to point that out in class, I can help you feel your own greater trochanter when we get in lab together. Um, but that's going to be, so here we're looking at an anterior view of the bone. So if you look anteriorly, you'll see the head, the neck, the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter, and the shaft. If you kind of keep coming down the shaft to the inferior or distal part of the bone, you will find uh, a couple of epicondyles. If you remember, like we saw in the humerus, we had a medial and lateral epicondyle. Here on the femur, we also have a medial and lateral epicondyle. Uh, 
I'll tell you that clinically, these are not, these don't come up nearly as often as the medial and lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Um, so yes, they're there, but um, they don't cause as much trouble here on the femur. So if you've got uh, epicondyles, then you must also have condyles. So that's going to be uh, the lateral condyle and the medial condyle. And that's what's going to articulate. Those condyles will articulate with the tibia bone to form the knee joint. So we'll see that here in a couple of pictures. All right, well, just as we can see a bone in the anterior view, of course, we can look at the bone in the posterior view, which is what we're looking at here. And remember that you should do the same thing. You should always ask yourself, what view am I looking at? Is it anterior, posterior, lateral, medial? What am I looking at? So here we're going to look at a posterior view of the same bone of the femur, and you can see again the head. I think the neck becomes even more visible here. Uh, the greater trochanter, you can see, kind of runs into the lesser trochanter. So we can kind of separate them like that. Uh, and I'm not really making you learn any of these other uh, parts on there. So as long as you know head, neck, greater, and lesser trochanter, you'll be good. Uh, as we come down here, I do want to mention this uh, popliteal surface because the back of the knee, remember we call the popliteus, so you're going to start seeing that term popliteus, popliteal, uh, over and over. Uh, so uh, that's the popliteal surface of the femur is going to be basically the distal posterior part that forms uh, the back of the knee. Uh, and then, of course, you can see I think the condyle is easier, the medial and the lateral uh, condyle, and then, of course, the epicondyles, which I mentioned were kind of less significant in the femur. But those condyles, the medial and the lateral condyle, those are going to articulate with the tibia we'll see here. But... All right, so now I wanted to get back to the story of Edna, and I just wanted to um, kind of see where your thinking was. We talked about how she fell and kind of her, bat, her, her back, her butt, her hip, her knee were all hurting and she couldn't walk and her leg was externally rotated and seemed shorter. So I don't know if anybody thought of where, where maybe the injury was. Maybe you said her hip, um, and that's not wrong, but, but saying hip is not very uh, specific. So, for example, when we say hip, do you mean the iliac crest? Do you mean, you know, the pubic bone, the, the ischium, the ilium? Uh, or do you mean like what most of, most of us mean when we talk about a hip fracture? What we really mean is the femur was fractured, uh, either at its head, uh, neck, or somewhere proximally in the femur. Um, we call that a hip fracture. So Edna did, of course, have a hip fracture. And let's see if we can find out where it is. So we're looking at a an x-ray of the pelvis here. And if we look over here on the right, which is the kind of the normal one, right? Her pain is on the left, so... The, the right side should be normal. You can see this is the shaft of the femur, right? There is a lesser trochanter. Up here is a greater trochanter. You can see right here is the neck, right? And then that's the head fitting in the acetabulum to make the hip joint. Well, let's look now on the left. Let's go ahead and look at the shaft. That looks to be okay. Here is the lesser trochanter. That seems to be okay. Uh, we get up here, we kind of lose the greater trochanter. I'm not really sure, right? Maybe that's a little bit of it there, but it should kind of be out there like that. So we've kind of lost the greater trochanter. And then we come to the neck, right? You can see the head is still there. And the neck should be coming off here, right? But look at where your neck is. It's way up here. So we can see that there's been a fracture between the head and the neck right there. So we would call this a femoral neck fracture. We often use FX for fracture. And remember, the, the, the leg was externally rotated. So this bone has kind of rotated in that direction. And so our trochanter has also rotated posteriorly. So we can't see the greater trochanter because the bone has rotated externally. Um, and that's 
uh, greater trochanter is now posterior and it's hard to see on the x-ray. So yes, Edna has a hip fracture, but when we say hip fracture in medicine, what we really mean is a femoral fracture. And usually we're talking about a femoral neck fracture, or we call, if you have one here, an intertrochanteric fracture, one that happens in between the greater and lesser trochanters. Once we kind of get fractures down lower, then we would call them femoral fractures. We wouldn't call them hip fractures anymore because we consider this area to be the hip. So yes, it's a hip fracture, but it's really a femoral neck fracture. Okay, as we continue to move down distally from the hip, uh, so of course we had the femur, uh, and we'll just kind of stop here briefly at the patella or the kneecap. Remember, the patella is the largest sesamoid bone in our body, kind of the floating bone, if you remember. Sesamoid means floating bone. And what's interesting about the patella is developmentally, what happens is your quadriceps muscle forms, and then right kind of towards the end of that quadriceps muscle, the, um, the patella begins to form right inside the tendon. And so it actually ends up separating your quadriceps tendon into a superior tendon and an inferior tendon. So in that sense, it kind of grows right, right into um, the quadriceps bone, or sorry, the quadriceps muscle. And so it becomes really important as a site of attachment for the quadriceps tendon, both superior, superiorly in the patella and inferiorly in the patella. So you have part of the quadriceps tendon is gonna insert uh, up here superiorly, and you're gonna have some of it that inserts um, down here inferiorly, and that's what actually helps you uh, extend your knee. So if your knee is bent, if you're sitting right now watching this, go ahead and extend your knee all the way, and that extension requires the attachment of the quadriceps to the patella. So if your patella is, wasn't there or it gets shattered, you're gonna have a hard time extending your leg. Or if you cut this tendon or cut this tendon, uh, tearing it, for example, um, when we were in Africa, oh, maybe two years ago now, two and a half years ago, uh, I was trying to teach some of my residents how to play basketball. And so we had a basketball hoop that I had found somewhere and we were playing, I think, three on three or two on two. And I went to jump over this very tall Somali guy. He was about six foot five. Uh, you know, I'm only about five foot ten. And so I must have tried to jump extra high or something. And I jumped up to, to do a fadeaway on him, kind of pushed off my left leg jumping. And I had immediate pain in my knee and fell to the ground. And I kind of looked up at him and I thought, why did this guy just kick me in the knee? But as I looked up at him, I noticed he was looking down at me and he was saying, why is this guy laying on the floor? What happened to him? And I realized that this guy didn't kick me. What had happened was when I, when I did all that force and contracted my quadriceps muscle to try and jump to do my fadeaway jump shot, I had torn this part, this inferior part of my quadriceps tendon, what we call the patellar tendon, and it had torn completely off of the patella so that I could not physically extend my leg. It was impossible. No matter how much I wanted to, I could not extend my leg because the muscle was no longer attached. Um, and of course, I had to go and have surgery for that. We uh, flew to Kenya and had surgery done there. Um, and now I can play tennis and basketball and it's fine. But um, for several months, I was kind of out of commission after tearing that patellar tendon. So the patella is really important for the function of the knee it helps us extend our knee through its connections with the quadriceps muscle and the tendons of the quadriceps muscle. All right, so you can see that tiny patella kind of sitting right there over the knee joint. So part of it is superior to the femur and part of it is superior to the tibia. Um, we're gonna keep going distal. So we had, um, of course we had the pelvis, then we had the femur, then we had the patella. Now we're gonna look at the tibia and the fibula. The fibula is the very small bone that sits laterally in your leg. The tibia is the much larger bone that sits more medial. Uh, the tibia is the bone that really transfers all the weight. If you think about when you're standing, uh, the weight kind of goes from your spine to the pelvis, and then from the pelvis, the weight is transferred to each femur, 
and from the femur, the weight is really transferred to the tibia. Notice here, notice that the fibula, if we just blow this up a little bit, the fibula does not touch the femur. This is the femur here. So none of the weight from the femur really gets transferred to the fibula. The fibula is actually a bone that you could live without. Uh, if you break your fibula, of course it will hurt, and of course you'll, you know, you'll have to kind of uh, stay off it and have some kind of a splint or a cast for it to heal. But um, it's really no loss. In fact, sometimes if you need a bone graft, like let's say you uh, you broke a more important bone somewhere and you need to get a little piece of bone to stick in there and help bone to grow back, they will take a chunk of bone out of your fibula uh, because it's really not a very necessary bone. You can you can live quite well and do quite well without your fibula bone. So the main bone in the lower leg is the tibia. Uh, like for example, when you say that you hit your shin, uh, you're actually talking about hitting your tibia, usually around that area. Uh, so most of what we'll focus on will be the tibia. We'll talk a little bit about the fibula as well. Here on the x-ray, this is going to be a, a probably a, a child or teenager, you can tell, because you've got the growth plates. You see the growth plate here uh, in the distal femur, another growth plate coming through here in the proximal tibia, another growth plate here in the proximal fibula, and distally you can see more growth plates there and there. So this is this is someone who hasn't finished growing yet. And you can see the femur is here, right? And you've got the condyles. So you've got the lateral condyle. This is a, a right leg. So you've got uh, the lateral condyle and the medial condyle. And they are going to articulate with condyles of the tibia, lateral and medial condyles of the tibia. And you see that the fibula is actually distal to that joint and really does not partake in the knee joint. Now, the fibula has a joint here where it's kind of connected to the tibia, uh, but it's not directly connected to the femur. So let's take a look in the anterior view. So this is an anterior view. Uh, and we'll start up here. This is going to be superior. And then we'll kind of move our way down inferiorly. And there's just a couple of structures that I want to mention on the tibia. So we already talked about uh, the medial and the lateral condyle, which should be easy to remember because the femur also has a medial and lateral condyle. Um, an important landmark is called the tibial tuberosity. And it sits uh, just below the knee and pretty much in the middle of your tibia. So if you are you know, sitting watching this right now, go ahead and touch your kneecap and then kind of continue to feel distal to the kneecap and you'll get kind of a soft spot under the kneecap. And then the next kind of bony thing sticking out that you feel, that's your tibial tuberosity. And this is an important landmark for some musculoskeletal disorders and it's also an important landmark if you ever have to put uh, an intraosseous needle into a bone uh, for someone who's, you know, basically dying. Uh, you will feel that tibial tuberosity, and then you'll go just a little bit uh, medial to that, and you'll put your needle in there. So get comfortable feeling that tibial tuberosity. Okay, we have the head of the fibula, which is going to articulate. You can see there's a little joint right there between the fibula and the tibia. And then we've got the shaft of the fibula and the shaft of the tibia. Okay, if we continue to go distal on these bones and pick up with the shaft of the fibula, the shaft of the tibia, you can see there's an interosseous membrane just like there was between the radius and ulna. You can see there's a second tibiofibular joint uh, down here inferiorly or distally, just like there was with the ulnus and radia. There was a proximal joint and there was a distal joint. So those are both called tibiofibular joints. One is superior and one is inferior. Okay, but the, the really important parts distally that I want you to know are the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus. So the medial malleolus is always going to come off of the tibia because the tibia sits medial on your leg. So if you'll feel all the way down to your ankle and feel on the inside of your ankle, the medial part of your ankle, that bump that comes out of your ankle, that's the medial malleolus. And if you rub your hand around and feel the outside of your ankle, you'll feel another bump 
That's the lateral malleolus. Okay, we could also take a superior view of the <clears throat> um, tibia. So that's this one over here. And if you kind of looked down superiorly, you would see the lateral and the medial condyle, which is going to articulate with the femur and form the knee joint. And then you would also see that tibial tuberosity kind of projecting forward. Now you could also look at an inferior view distally of the tibia and uh, tibia and fibula, and you can see the articular surface here. See how there's kind of a depression in here? That's where the, um, the tibia will articulate with the talus bone and form your ankle joint. Uh, and then you can see the medial malleolus here coming off of the tibia, and you can see the lateral malleolus here coming off of the fibula. So these are just a superior and inferior view of the articular surfaces. All right, as we then move down, um, we'll, we get to the foot. And of course, you're going to have to learn all of these bones, just like you had to learn all of the bones of the, the hand. Um, but I want to point out a couple of them. So I mentioned that uh, the, the femur transfers all the weight of the body down to the tibia. And then the tibia transfers all the weight of the body down right here onto this bone, which is called the talus. And so we call your ankle joint, often we call it the uh, tibio-talar joint. Because it's the joint between the tibia bone and the talus. We already mentioned before, when we were learning kind of general anatomical terms, that your heel is called the calcaneus, and that bone, that heel bone, that's the name of it, calcaneus. So sitting on top of the calcaneus will be the talus, and that's the one that articulates with the tibia and kind of takes the weight of the body. Sitting in front of the talus on a superior view, so this is looking at a superior view, would be the navicular bone. That's a bone that's commonly fractured. If you remember uh, when we were talking about the bones of the hand, I said the scaphoid bone was the carpal bone that was kind of commonly fractured. I would say probably the navicular bone is the most commonly fractured tarsal bone. So you'll want to know where that is and be able to find that on your exam so that you can press on it and see if it hurts. Then that might make you worry about a fracture there. That's the navicular bone sitting in front of the talus. Then we're going to find several more tarsal bones kind of uh, in relationship to the navicular bone. So if you stay on the great toe side, so that's the um, this side over here, uh, you'll find three cuneiform bones that sit just distal to the navicular bone. So, and this is how I would suggest that you learn these. I mean, the, the talus is gonna be the big bone on top, the calcaneus is gonna be the big bone on the bottom that's posterior, that's your heel. And then distal to the talus is the navicular bone. And then distal to the navicular bone, you have three cuneiform bones. And they should be easy to remember because they're just directional. So you have medial, you have lateral, and you have intermediate, which runs in between. Okay, and then lateral to the lateral cuneiform bone is the cuboid bone. So if you'll remember them that way, you should be able to uh, kind of keep straight all of these um, tarsal bones. You see here, tarsal bones. Okay, just as in the hand, we had carpal bones and metacarpal bones. Here in the foot, we have tarsal bones and we have metatarsal bones. And they're numbered the same way. One, two, three, four, and five. And just as the fifth metacarpal bone was uh, commonly fractured through punching, uh, you will see that that fifth metatarsal bone is commonly broken through um, twisting injuries, through uh, running. Um, uh, runners will sometimes get a stress fracture in the fifth metatarsal. Um, and so that'll be an important one to remember. Uh, and then, of course, distal to the metatarsals, we have phalanges, just like we did in the finger. And toes two through five are going to have three phalanges, just like the fingers did. 
whereas uh, toe number one, the, the great toe, is going to have only two uh, phalanges, just as the thumb only had two phalanges. And we're going to give them the same name. It's going to be proximal, middle, and distal. Uh, and then you're going to say, you know, according to its number. So the, for example, the middle phalanx, uh, third phalanx would be there. The distal first phalanx would be there. So sometimes we say, in singular, we say phal phalanx. Or you can say phalange, or some people say phalange. Uh, I usually say phalanx for one and phalanges for multiple. All right, so very similar to the hand as far as the metatarsal and phalanges go. So once you've learned the hand, the foot should be easy. Uh, if we kind of uh, flip over the foot and look at an inferior, so this would be an inferior view. This, is a, this one was a superior view. Uh, when you look inferiorly, the first bone that you see is that huge calcaneus or your heel bone, right? You can see just a little bit of the talus because most of the talus is superior. Uh, you can see a little bit of the navicular. Remember that sits in front of the, right, in front of or distal to the talus. And then your three cuneiform bones, uh, medial, intermediate, and lateral. And then lateral to the lateral is that cuboid bone. So you're just getting a different view. And then, of course, you've got your uh, metatarsals and your, and your phalanges as well. If we look laterally, what becomes uh, medial and lateral, what becomes most noticeable is the curvature. Your feet are not flat. There is a curve to the feet. And we know that when we all know the term arch, the arch of the foot. But the reason for the arch, um, maybe people aren't quite as familiar with. So part of what the, the arch does is try and help share the load, so to speak. So because the, the, the hips transfer weight to the femur and the femur to the tibia and the tibia to the talus, and then the talus sits on top of the calcaneus, in order to help transfer that weight so that the whole foot can kind of take on some of that load, you have an arch that is made through tendons and ligaments that kind of helps transfer the weight from the talus that goes down to the calcaneus, and it helps disperse that weight so that all of those bones, all of these bones, take some of the weight on. So it helps to kind of transfer the weight. The other thing it does is prevent pinching of nerves and arteries uh, by giving you some flexibility and some bounce in the bottom of your foot. It keeps the nerves and arteries in that part of the foot from getting compressed. And the last thing it does is absorb some shock. Um, think of like a spring uh, having some give, right? Having some flexibility when you bounce on it, it's able to move and absorb some of the weight. And so the same thing with, your, uh, with the arches of your feet. As you run, as you walk, those arches can kind of expand and then recontract, and they can absorb some of the energy and some of the weight uh, that would otherwise kind of be crushing the bottom of your feet. So these arches become uh, quite important. People who do not have proper arches have a lot of trouble with their feet. The last thing I wanted to mention was the terms dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, because most of the time in the body we're talking, when we talk about a joint, we talk about flexion of the joint makes the joint smaller, and extension of the joint makes the joint more open or larger, uh, the angle of the joint larger. But for some reason, when we get to the ankle, that all changes, and we use the term flexion to talk about both directions, and that gets to be a little bit confusion. So you see there's dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion means you are moving your toe. Think of taking your big toe and moving it towards your head. That's going to be dorsiflexion. If you take your big toe and you point it towards the floor, that's plantar flexion. Remember, plantar means the bottom of your foot, right? So if you're kind of flexing your toe towards the bottom of your foot, then that's plantar flexion. So instead of using extension, we don't really talk about extension of the ankle. We talk about either dorsiflexion or plantar flexion.
Okay, when we get to lab together, we'll have a chance to look at all these bones. Make sure you write down your questions, bring them with you. I'll be happy to help you um, figure out things that maybe weren't so clear when you heard them in the lecture. Uh, just make sure you come prepared with those questions when we meet with each other in class.